Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. During the month of March, we're going to be focusing on the conversations with the Apostle John. This is not John the Baptist. Oh, he's a great guy. Scary, but this is John, the John who wrote the Gospels, uh, the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Um, He was perhaps the closest disciple of Jesus, and uh, one of the characteristics of John's gospel is that he spends a lot more time on in-depth conversations that Jesus has with others and with individuals. Maybe John was in the same room when Jesus talked to folks like Dick Nicodemus, uh, when maybe other apostles weren't. Or perhaps John debriefed with Jesus after his conversation with a Samaritan woman. Whatever the case, John's account places a greater emphasis, compared to the other Gospels, a greater emphasis on the conversations versus the action. There's plenty of both in each, but John really highlights those conversations. John provides a way also for us to listen in and be part of these conversations with Jesus. Um, Today's conversations with Jesus follow Jesus causing havoc um, in the the temple. He grabs a whip and he starts driving out the sheep and oxen along with those who are simply conducting business. Now this is certainly different in a a wide variety of ways from, you know, we've had a variety of tension and and protests, and these are different than some of those. However, there's some ways in which it may help us understand these things a little bit, in which they're the same. For one, there was undoubtedly a variety of very strong opinions and feelings about what Jesus had done. And I'm also sure, (laughs) thinking of those money changers, there are plenty of business owners who were not happy that Jesus had disrupted their livelihood. But it's also important to point out a difference. Jesus wasn't protesting at City Hall. No, it's more like he was causing a ruckus at church, at the temple to be specific. John says Jesus was zealous for the house and name of the Lord. Jesus was outraged that the leaders of God's people were turning a prophet off the piety of the people, all the while misrepresenting Yahweh to the sheep of Israel. Jesus, at least here, temporarily halted the abuse of the temple, and we can read elsewhere how Jesus prophesies that God will once and for all halt these abuses. Um, The scene uh, is explosive, but John actually spends more focus on the conversations than he does the action. Looking at Each of the characters is what we're going to do next. We're going to look at each individual character and and what they say to kind of help us make sense of this scene and and get to the point that Jesus and John wants us to arrive at. In this case, John and the apostles don't really say much of anything, um, which is probably a a why. It's why they look actually like they know what they're doing this time, because they don't say anything. They just listen. But at the end of the stories, the disciples don't get it at the beginning, but at the end, they have an aha moment that helps us connect what Jesus is saying. So um, let's start with Jesus. First, of course, uh, we have Jesus saying, get this junk out of here. Don't turn the holy house of my father into a profitable business. And Jesus will also make the the statement. It's really kind of more of a challenge. Uh, Not not quite, but kind of like, come at me, bro. Uh, Destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. Um, So if we had to pick one word to describe Jesus, it would be irate or mad, if you prefer. Uh, Next, we have the character of the the Jews, the people. Now, I kind of... You know, I mean, I'm familiar with these stories, but I was kind of expecting the next character to be the chief priests or the money changers. But perhaps they're simply off in the corner stuttering protests. 
or maybe they're just too busy wringing their hands, crawling on the ground, gathering their money, or, or chasing down their scattered sheep. Whatever the case, John only records what the people say, and that Jesus is really trying to communicate something to the people, not just to the leaders. Now, we don't really know what these people are thinking or feeling, and chances are they probably weren't entirely sure what to think or feel either. Um, what they say, though, is, what do you mean? It's, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. You can't possibly rebuild it in three days. If we had to think of one word to describe the crowds, they are confused. So are the disciples, but eventually they will understand because they kept following Jesus. And that's a big part of being a Christian. Jesus will shock and confuse you at times. It's just, it's going to happen. If it hasn't happened yet, you might almost want to check if you're really following Jesus. He will shock and confuse us. He will confront us. However, if we stick with him, Jesus knows what he's doing. And if you're lucky and pay attention one day, you might even know what he's doing or, or what he was doing in your life. Well, um, King David is also part of this conversation. Now, even though he's been dead for a millennium, what King David said was still really important to the people of God. After all, I mean, they sang song, his songs in the temple and even on their way to the temple. So it's kind of like they, they sang the song in church and they sang them on the radio on the drive to church. And if anyone cared about the temple of the Lord, where Jesus is and he's got a problem with, uh, and, and anyone cared about honoring God's name, it was King David. Remember David, I mean, that's this picture. David acted a fool while dancing in as the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant came into Jerusalem for the first time. In fact, his wife despises him. And David says, I'll act even more undignified than this. You know, this is, this is awesome. Forget about me. This is great. Um, David, right, he didn't build the temple, but he really wanted to. And he collected practically all the materials, and he really made it a cinch for Solomon, his son, to do it. Remember the story of David and Goliath. Why did David confront Goliath? Because Goliath blasphemed God's holy name. David was, right, we already said this, the most important contributing author to the hymn book of the Old Testament, the Psalms. David is or was, in one word, faithful. And by quoting David, John is trying to help us connect this story of Jesus to the story of David. Jesus is certainly the le legitimate king, but perhaps more to the point here, he's the pinnacle of someone who cares for and defends the name of Yahweh and God's people. Um, and like David, the one who really sort of builds the temple. And um, uh, well, Jesus is zealous for God to be represented correctly and for his people to relate to him in healthy ways. And God's not interested in a profitable institution. Rather, he's interested in true worship and faithful interactions with his father. I mean, that's... We just read a little bit further. We could come to Mark chapter 4 where Jesus tells, says pretty much exactly that to a Samaritan woman. Um, however, the, to go back to the people, the, the Jews want to know, you know, like, who died and made you king, Jesus? And Jesus, if they had asked it that way, he might have said, no, no, not quite. First I'll die, and then God will make me king. Or he could have given some pretty obvious signs, like, Moses testifying to Yahweh's power by doing miraculous things such as changing his staff into a snake or saving the people. Um, uh, well, there's echoes of that in John chapter 3. Or turning the water into blood. Uh, echoes of that in John chapter 19. I mean, the truth is, Jesus throughout John does give signs for those with eyes to see. And for that matter, with those who have eyes that can't see, he makes them see. Well, what he says, though, however, is tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. 
the real sign of Jesus' authority is his crucifixion and resurrection. You see, Jesus will not send plagues or turn water into blood like Moses for proof. Rather, his water and blood will flow with life from his pierced side. I put two different translations up here because it helps. Uh, um, sometimes, again, you, you, it, when you translate in any language, you, it's, it's sometimes hard to capture everything. And these different translations, there's a variety of translations, um, but they, they both kind of focus on these two things. And Jesus is telling us two different things. First of all, he's talking about being raised up which is resurrection language. But he's also talking about building, or, you know, just like you raise up a building, building or rebuilding the temple, because, I mean, that's exactly what he's talking about, Uh, the temple being destroyed and him rebuilding it. And the significance of that is the temple is where God is reconciled to his people, and we'll see later in John's gospel that it's really where God is reconciled to all people. Um, Well, uh, Jesus' passion um, for his father's house will consume him. Now, David said that, right? And and it was true for David in this sense. Uh, One, David's passion and drive to represent God and to build this temple really consumed much of his life. David, again, practically built the first temple with his passionate work and planning. He didn't actually put it together, but he got all the materials there. Jesus' zeal for God's name and faithful representation will consume him too, right? You know, when someone is passionate or consumed, it drives them to do something. And and we could certainly say that about David um, and the temple. But we call the story of Jesus' arrest and his death the passion story, right? Because it was no accident, but the outpouring of Jesus' soul, his, his passion, what drove him, his care for faithfulness to his Father and for the rescue of you and me and all those sheep, including those who are not of this pasture, to use his words. Zeal for the reconciliation of God's people to him will lead Jesus to being consumed, fully spent, and dying upon a cross. After Jesus was raised from the dead, John tells us the disciples were like, oh, oh, that's what he meant. Um, Well, what God values most, turns out, as we've kind of been talking about this over the last couple weeks, it's not groceries or goods or money. What he values is repentance and Faith, or maybe even better, faithfulness. In Jesus taking on human flesh, God is with his people in an even more concrete way than in building and mortar. The original plan uh, to be with his people in the Old Testament was in a building. And that original plan to be with his people in a building was a good plan. However, phase two, God being with his people as a person, as Jesus, was even better. Well, uh, God had, re- had to reject the old temple, the very first one that Solomon had built and David had established. In books like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I put some verses up here, he had to reject the temple in their day in order to actually get his people's attention. Um, Now, Jesus, the more true temple, would be rejected and broken in order to get the people's in our attention. Now, in the Old Testament, God punished his people for their rejection of him. But in the passion of Christ, God's own son was punished as a result of God's people rejecting him. He was abused by us. But because of God's mercy, he was also abused for us. He was able to endure and overcome our abuse. And God raised him up on the third day and has reconciled us to himself through his son. 
Well, Jesus being killed and raised and then uh, raised up took it to another level or took us to another level. You know, phase three of God's plan was Jesus didn't just lower himself. He lowered himself to be raised up and to raise up us with him. God would not only raise Jesus back up, he would make a new people and place for God's people in the body of Christ. Because if Jesus has been raised, if his body has been raised, and you and I are the body of Christ, the body of, the church, uh, of Christ, then the body of Christ is raised up, and you and I will be raised up. Uh, now that we have been baptized into his name, because we have partaken of his body and blood shed for us on the cross, we are included with God's people. We are included with Christ. We are uh, with him. Jesus didn't just die and rise again, right? We have been crucified with him, and we will be raised up with him and with God for all eternity because Jesus overcame. In Jesus' name, amen.